Hi, I'm Vince Panesco, and I'm going to give you a talk on the unlocking the mysteries of the proposed Chehalis River Dam. I like I grew up in Chehalis on the edge of the floodplain, and I'd like to share some of my experiences there with you. And in addition, I uh, worked at Hanford for over 40 years as a chemist, engineer, and manager. After retirement, after I was after retirement, I was on the Hanford Advisory Board for another 20 years, providing technical presentations from time to time. While at Hanford, I served uh, for five years as the technical manager of a 10-person uh, national safety team, which reviewed the design of large Department of Energy facilities, uh, large when I mean they're over 100 million, at various DOE sites across the country. Uh, I just recently gave a webinar on the geology of Hanford, focusing on the radioactive waste, which is trapped on ancient lake beds underlying the Hanford area. That the webinar is available on YouTube. I'm currently the manager of the Panesco Tree Farms LLC, on which the Rio Lime Dam is now proposed. Uh, I began reviewing the technical documents and geology of the Willapaw Hills relating to the dam back in 2009, and uh, I've been re uh, reviewing the documents uh, since then. And uh, I'm going to share with you the findings from those documents during this uh, presentation. So, first slide I'm going to show you is a picture of the floodplain and Chehalis. <clears throat> the reason I want to show this to you is that, uh, well, you can see the floodplain is defined over here, the Schubert Road on the west side. And the interesting thing about Chehalis is there's a, a line of green that's been established for over 150 years. Uh, for over 150 years, we've known where the floodplain is and, and development is uh, sort of been precluded. Uh, people are smart enough not to, to develop in the floodplains. Um, the, and, and if you wanted to, if the flood layers got higher, there is uh, opportunities here for uh, putting levees in to protect this area here along the uh, uh, on the edge of Chehalis, if, if needed to be. In fact, that uh, here you have the development around the airport, and that is indeed one of the plans of the future here, just to put a levee around that development up here, because that's in the floodplain area. Um, I grew up uh, here uh, on the edge of the floodplain, or just on just off of Main Street. Uh, this is Highway 6 coming in I-5 here. Uh, the Dellenbach Creek comes in. There used to be a bridge. This all used to be lowland. Uh, the hotel that's here now, uh, and the timber line is uh, over the where the house used to be. Our house used to be right here on Prindle Street. This is Prindle Street here, and uh, the Main Street here, a block over. Uh, you've got the uh, old Milwaukee line here and the uh, railroad tracks running through town, the farm store. And uh, the, we, the house that we lived in right here is, as I say, on the edge of the floodplain. The water would come up every year. We would have high water uh, uh, and they would come up to the up to about the edge of Quincy Avenue here. Right. This is Quincy right here. And. Uh, then later, the 1990 and 96, the flood would, uh, 96 or so, there was like three or four feet of water here. Uh, the little arrow the, here, this little spot is the dairy bar, the hamburger stand there. And you may remember pictures uh, in the Chronicle of the water being right up to the window of that, which is about four feet uh, deep. And that, I think that must have been the 96 flood that they should, the water got that deep here, about four feet. But... Uh, uh, so let's see. So anyhow, I, I grew up in here. In, in, at the time, this was a low. We hadn't filled this, and the, the, we would have high water every year. Uh, and I'd get a raft and we'd go out and play around on the high water. Now, my grandfather bought this house in 1910, and uh, he so he purchased it in 1910. In 27 years. He didn't have any uh, water to speak of until 1937 or so. Water came up to the top step right here on this. Barely see it here on the porch. And I'm using that porch as a gauge because in 1950, it was 53 years later before the next flood, 
got water in the house. In 1990, there was two inches of water. 96, there's two feet of water in the house. Now, in the 2007 flood, there is four feet of water in the house, and then it was demolished in 2008. Um, what's interesting is that, uh, well, two things. Uh, the, the definition of flood here was based on our porch. And uh, when you uh, go back and you look here at Prindle Street, well, we're here on the corner with our porch. But uh, so we called it high water when water came up to here. It's only a couple inches deep in Prindle Street. But for the people down further down Prindle Street, their houses had water in it uh, every other year or two. And so for them, it was a flood. But for us, it was just high water. So uh, your definition of what is a, a flood and for for our depth, for our purposes here on, on this house, uh, we went 80 years without just one major flood. The thing I want to point out is if you notice in this picture, there's a wooden sidewalk there. And I remember in the 1940s coming out of this house and, and uh, during a flood and that uh, sidewalk uh, floated. And people that, uh, that uh, lived here down Prindle Street they could get on the wooden sidewalk here and walk. Of course, you, you, you'd wear boots anyhow because it was still sinking a, a little bit. And they could get access to these houses down here. Uh, they didn't need a boat because they could get to their houses on uh, uh, walking on this wooden sidewalk. Well, what's, what's fascinating is that this wooden sidewalk existed in 1910. It looked brand new. And so the, the flooding uh, was obvious. Uh, flooding occurred prior to 1910 uh, and that the th city went through the trouble of building a floating sidewalk. But from our perspective, just looking at the fact that uh, over 80 years, there was only like one really major flood at that time, uh, raised another, another interesting question. And uh, well, first of all, let's look at the, uh, the Grand Mound and the peak levels uh, of every year. And you can see that there's sort of a baseline uh, that the floods existed, uh, the peak years, except the three, uh, 1990, 96, and 2007, uh, were the major floods the, uh, that occurred there on, on the Grand Mound area. And the question then is uh, back to, us when we, we just had one major flood in 80 years. From 1890 to, nine, to 1930, you had up to 35 sawmills between Chehalis and Wallville. And they clear cut everything they could along the river, going back 5, 10, 15 miles away from the river at some places here where they had railroad railroads going away from the Chehalis River. You had mills, you had seven or so in Chehalis. Cueto had a small one, Latel a couple, Adna had Ruth, Curtis, Calabre, Ceres, Mescal, Mays. And most people don't even know where Mays is. Two, they had two sawmills there, Baker uh, Lumber Company. Uh, there's actually another one, uh, didn't list it. Five, Dryad, uh, one uh, Doty, and then uh, several large mills in PL, uh, McCormick, Reynolds, and, and Wallville. And the interesting thing is that uh, that uh, these, uh, you see a picture, uh, this is, this is uh, McCormick, just west of PL, and the hills are pretty much uh, logged off. And uh, then you see, here's a picture of Wallville Lumber Company, and you can see the hills back here are, are all logged off uh, in a pretty big mill in Wallville where my uh, mother was raised. And, and uh, same thing with my mother, uh, father-in-law and my mother-in-law were all associated with PL, and lived in PL, born and raised in PL in the Wallville area. Uh, this photo uh, <laughs> shows in, uh, uh, the, 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 the trestle and a uh, really cool uh, Shea engine steam engine on top of the trestle. But if you look through the trestle, you see the hills in the background are just stripped. There's nothing on them. Uh, so the lumber is stripped. 
And the question is, does logging uh, affect flooding? Well, if logging affects, and this, uh, if logging uh, affects flooding, why didn't we have a major flood every year? Uh, as, according to our front steps on Prindle Street, we only had one major flood from 1910 to 1990. This is a picture of a logging camp, and these logging camps were set up 5, 10, 15 miles away from the river so that uh, people would, uh, they could bring these uh, shacks in on, on railroad cars and set up a camp so that loggers could go, uh, could stay in camp all week and then go back to town on weekends and uh, spend their money. <clears throat> and they had a good time doing that. Um, so this is illustrated that they could set up camps uh, miles from the, from the river. Uh, when I was uh, in uh, Boy Scouts in Chehalis, uh, the Elks, Chehalis Elks uh, Troop, two, uh, tw Troop 21, we took a hike up the uh, 1950s uh, up to the, uh, the water intake in the, in the Wacom River, the North Fork of the Wacom River, east of uh, Centralia and Chehalis. And uh, this is what we saw. We went to the intake and we hiked in uh, on a uh, logging track tracks, logging roads, and railroad tracks for four or five miles. And uh, this is all we saw, clear cut. And, and uh, the whole area was stripped and for miles. And again, the question is, why didn't the Tawakam River have these major floods uh, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s when it was, all this land was clear cut? So that's still a puzzle, for, at least for me, uh, asking the question of, uh, is this logging today, because a lot of people will raise the question today that uh, all these companies, uh, warehouser logging uh, causes flooding. Well, uh, if it does, ask them the question, well, hey, all this property, 300 to 600 square, uh, 100 square miles of land was clear cut uh, in, as I say, 1890, 1930, period of 40 years. And we didn't have a lot of major floods back then, as far as the records show. There was a few, but not, not very many. It should have been uh, a lot. OK, let's go back and look at uh, the, this, the, this diagram here. Again, look, we're looking at Grand Mound. And uh, it shows the three the, the flood, the major floods that we've had in my lifetime here, the 100 year, uh, 1990. 96 and 2007 year. All of you are, are fairly familiar with that. And again, that they sort of stand out above a baseline uh, if you look at it this way. But and then the, but you can uh, if you go down and, and, and see here what this is again. It shows the baseline that we set up. The, you can sort of the background here. And again, it shows those three standing out uh, different from that. And uh, Doty, uh, up uh, between PL and, and Doty, there's a river gauge. And it, it sort of agrees. The interesting thing is when you go back and you compare this, notice that the, the floods here, 50,000 uh, cubic feet per peaks, and this goes up to 70 to 80 up here. It's pretty much a jump between 50 and 70. That's a pretty significant jump. And you look at uh, the PL gauge and or Doty gauge, and uh, yeah, not that much increase here. So there's a lot more, a lot more water came from other places. And then uh, where we really hit the bonanza was 2007, where you uh, you got over 60,000 here. And so the 2007 flood was really uh, from the upper uh, Chehalis River. That that was more uh, uh, consistent with what we, we've we uh, high rainfall in the uh, uh, upper Chehalis above PL. And, uh, and so that, that stood out. 2007 is at Doty is being uh, quite significantly different than the baseline here. The previous two floods, not so much. And so uh, what that means and the significance of that was uh, to be discussed at other times. Um, so if you look at the definition of what a major flood is at, at Grand Mound today, 
uh, they set it at, at 38, uh, 38,500 cubic feet per second. And you can see that there's a, a lot of uh, uh, times that they've uh, exceeded that. Call them. So you could call these major floods, uh, 12 major floods, if you use that definition. Uh, and I, at the previous slide, we've driven a, uh, put a line through here saying, yeah, there's three really, three floods that really uh, were outstanding. But according to the definition that exists now today at Grand Mound, these are, there's 12 major floods. And uh, the interesting thing is if you take and go back here, you could draw a line like this and say, well, okay, hey, we've got you. You ain't seen nothing yet. Our floods are going up. And this in 2007 time frame, eight, nine time frame, this whole thing about, man, we got to build a dam with somewhere, anywhere. And as you know, the first uh, in 2009, the first uh, uh, study on the thing was to build two dams. The PUD uh, looked at that and they were, they were going to have one on the South Fork and one south of PL, uh, two dams initially. But uh, it was a, certainly a, a big influence, a big push to uh, build a dam and, and start looking. Well, let's look at some of the, the details here about why would you build a dam in uh, south of PL? Well, the, you look at the watershed north of Chehalis. You've got the Noachum, you've got the South Fork, you've got uh, Bunker Creek and Deep Creek and Elk Creek up here. And then you got the mainstream here. That's 11 to 14 percent of the watershed uh, upstream uh, of Chehalis. So, well, you look at that and you say, well, and it, there is numbers that go down as low as 8 percent, but somewhere in the neighborhood of, of, of this in here, 10 10 percent or so, 10, 11, 12. Um, it doesn't seem like, <laughs> excuse me, it doesn't seem like uh, that. That's uh, that's very much in terms of uh, uh, in terms of water rainfall that would. But if you look at it, you look at the rainfall. Rainfall in the hills, Willapaw Hills in this area, is about twice as much as you experience uh, along I-5 here, Chehalis with 48. Uh, these hills, and you can see the the hills, Willapaw Hills, uh, absorb the water and take. A lot of the water out of the clouds and by the time the clouds get to Shalish you don't get as much rain so you're typically looking at uh, the ballpark here of 100 inches uh, per year uh, affecting the Willapaw Hills and so that was one of the logic uh, points the logic of putting a dam here was this is where uh, of this uh, watershed above Shehalis where you had uh, most of the rain uh, Again, you could have, uh, I suppose, made the argument too that uh, that you could have put another dam up here. And uh, but anyhow, because that would collect even additional more water. But uh, but this is uh, what we're looking at. This this is, brings to, uh, brings up a, an interesting point, and that is that when you do have a rainstorm, kind of depends uh, on the direction of the storm. Now. If the storm comes up, which is pretty typical from the southwest, and you get one of these atmospheric rivers, which occurred in 2007, right over the dam, the uh, Doty gauge sitting here uh, definitely showed a lot more water for, uh, from a ratio standpoint than the, the gauges on the Nwakam River and uh, Scoopum Chuck over in this area here. Uh, however, uh, some of the years, 2009 particularly, and 2022, the rain came up I-5 from the south. And when it does, it sort of misses the dam. And uh, you get more rainfall in this area here and not so much over here on a, on a percentage basis. So it kind of depends on the direction. And of course, if you have flow coming in from the west, due west or even northwest, which is not, not doesn't happen all that often, but it does once in a while, uh, a dam being located in this lo here uh, isn't going to capture that. So uh, anytime you locate a dam, it, it uh, uh, 
the argument then is that, well, okay, uh, you're not going to get all of the rain uh, rainstorms that come in. You're going to capture those that go over the dam, but if they come in from another direction, uh, not over the dam, then the dam's not uh, doing as good of a job and uh, you don't capture the water that you think you're going to capture from that. Uh, that's where later in the discussion when I talk about having a levee, uh, if you put a levee to protect an area uh, from flooding, uh, uh, the levee doesn't care what direction the, the rainfall came from. And so a levee works uh, no matter what direction the storm comes from. The dam only works if the if the rainstorm actually comes over the dam or the area that behind the dam, uh, and that's the most efficient time for a, for a dam. Um, let's see here. The, this is a shows the ballpark peak flows, and um, again, this is shows the argument of why you would want a dam in PL when you look at the amount of water that's typical, uh, a typical 100-year peak flow. And uh, let's look at the Grand Mound, because the Grand Mound uh, uh, gauge, it, it mar it's uh, sitting there and it mark, uh, marks the, uh, uh, the uh, downstream of the whole watershed. So you can see this Kokumchuk, uh, maximum flow 13, 13 Noachum, South Fork 15, Elk 6. The Doty gauge will read about 25 uh, in that time, that area. Uh, but it, it it's used, there's no other gauges. Well, we had one for a couple of years up here and then we got that found out that the, the Doty gauge says 25,000 CF cubic feet per second. But that's at this gauge, and there's a bunch of cricks and stuff come in, and so it doesn't accurately reflect the dam. The dam's site south of PL is 70%, about 18,000 cubic feet per second to 80% of the flow at the Doty. And so if you're going to use the Doty uh, gauge to monitor flows in the future, you got to you got to say about, well, 80% of that's at the dam and 20% below the dam not going to be captured by the dam. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the dam here is going to, going to catch about 20,000 uh, CFS compared to all these others. So and you compare 20,000 CFF uh, coming out of uh, S coming out of uh, uh, above the dam to typical Grand Mount flood in the neighborhood of uh, 75,000 cubic feet per second. You can see that uh, maybe uh, this dam amounts to collecting uh, maybe close to one third, uh, 25% to, to uh, 30%, 35%, 25%, 35% of the water at Grand Mount that, that there are floods. And you got to look at the dynamics <clears throat> because the dynamics of this so shows you that the Skokumchuk, when you have a rainstorm, the Skokumchuk comes up and peaks first. And so it comes up, comes up and hits the water in the Black River and, and kind of holds it back. And then the Noachum comes in just a few hours after the Skookumchuk and then the South Fork comes in right after. They all, all three rain from these uh, Skookumchuk and the different uh, river basins arrive at the same time at Grand Mount. They arrive in sort of a, a parade. The Skookumchuk first, Noachum and then South Fork and lastly, uh, so, uh, but any time the Skookumchuk uh, gets a backup, can't be drain, can't drain into uh, or downstream here. It backs up. The Noachum come floods and has no place to 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 go, and and it backs up and floods Shahelis and Centralia. The South Fork comes along and adds, and then later the uh, water here, sometimes as much as 12 hours later, but. To you sometimes are quicker than that, uh, depending depending on the on the, the storm and all uh, comes in. But so there's a there's some dynamics that have to be taken into consideration, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk geology for a minute, and uh, I want to talk about basalt. 
the salts formed from lava flowing from fissures of the earth, in the earth. And uh, you're familiar with volcanoes and uh, Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens, St. Helens erupting. Uh, but in eastern, so lava, there's two kinds of, of basalt. One comes out of the ground, fissures in the ground. Another comes in the bottom of the oceans. And there are a lot more oceans than there were continents. So uh, uh, you had a lot more basalt. So let's talk about the two different kinds. The kind that uh, the most, most people know, to, or know about here in the state of Washington, what they call the Columbia River flood basalts. And what happens here is that you had fissures in eastern Washington open up and you had over 300 high volume individual lava flows come flowing down the Columbia River Gorge. And uh, it's act actually pretty fascinating how they, uh, the geology of Portland and uh, the area around Portland was altered. Then it came up north to Longview, then out towards. And it's interesting that some of these floods actually came north uh, over Chehalis and, and, and out towards uh, Aberdeen and out towards Elma underneath the ground here. Uh, but you see the area of the Wilpaw Hills at that time uh, uh, they didn't cover that area. They stayed more along with the route of, of the Columbia River right now. So, uh, well, okay, so this is basalt. This is lava that came out of the ground. And uh, there's, uh, as I say, uh, uh, there's some information here in terms of over 300 of these flows and uh, the various mountains and stuff that were the volcanoes and stuff. Uh, the, the interesting thing about basalt coming out of the Columbia River uh, basalt coming out of eastern Washington is this rock is strong. I call it strong basalt. You look at this rock and this is a real rock. This is hard. Uh, this chunk is, 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 you can hardly break it. Uh, it, it's a good, if you're going to build a dam, this is the stuff you want to build a dam against because you know when you drill a rock bolts in here to hold the side of a dam, that the, the rock is solid, it's going to hold it. And uh, you've got good solid rock. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, these pictures are really impressive. I, I enjoy them seeing this good solid rock because, uh, well, we'll get to it in a minute. And then you compare this now. Uh, because basalt flowing out of the ground uh, hardens and you get good solid rock. Okay, the second kind of basalt is flow, uh, created when it, when it comes up the, through the ocean and starts at the bottom of the ocean and uh, sometimes erupts through cracks in the ocean floor and layers of lava build up over time. And you can see some that may create islands. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is when lava comes out of the bottom of the ocean and uh, well, like even in uh, uh, the Hawaiian Islands today where you've got volcanoes and the lava goes down and drips into the sea. When this hot lava gets in and, and hits water, it creates steam and it creates gas bubbles within the rock as the lava quickly cools. And so gas bubbles weaken the rock. And you can read this, glass bubbles leave cavities within solidifying magna. The cavities reduce the what they call the unconfined compressive strength USS of basalt. What that means is they put it in a vise and start squeezing it and try to figure out how much uh, uh, pounds per square inch uh, before the basalt fails. Well, the basalt that uh, comes out of the ground in eastern Washington, it's got uh, uncompressed uh, strength U UCS. Uh, 14,000 to 40,000, typically even 30 to 40,000. That rock, the pictures of the rock we saw, were darn hard and uh, excellent rock. That's the rock you want to have to, to build a dam. Uh, but when the basalt comes out of the ground, it's got these gas bubbles in it. And so the it's really soft and you can break it really easily. And sometimes it's so soft you can break it with your hands. And so this, this basalt that's formed in the, in the islands uh, is, is, is subject to uh, cracking. It's full of gas bubbles. 
So let's just look at this a minute and then we go through. So here you are on the ocean. Here you are on the ocean floor. And you got the Pacific Ocean up here. So the molten lava comes out and it flows for uh, 100 years, 1,000 years. And it stops. And the volcano is inactive. And you have marine sediment uh, accumulating over it. Dead fish, sand, moves around and stuff. And so uh, and it's under pressure uh, of the ocean. And then uh, the volcano then shoots some more lava out. And now you've got uh, a layer of pillow basalt forming. And then the volcano is inactive and you've got marine sediment. Back and forth you go with different layers. Uh, back and forth creating islands in the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Like pack, stack, stack up of, of uh, pancakes. Well, let's go back and, and look a little bit about continental drift. Once upon a time, uh, North America and South America were, were snuggled up against uh, Europe and Africa. And, uh, th and then as the continent started drifting uh, across the Pacific, it uh, created the, the Atlantic Ocean here. There's not a whole lot of islands in here. There are more islands on the other side. Now, as these continents, the North America and South America, moved west, they scooped up these islands uh, uh, that were in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they called, <laughs> geologists have names for these things, accreted terrains. And, but the, basically, they were scooping up these stack of hotcakes and jamming them against here. Let's look at see what this, they call them accreted terrains. And so this is how the Willapaw Hills were formed with these islands jamming in here and then being twisted. And uh, subducting plate pushed them down and twisted them around. They jammed them together. Uh, and then there's upflow at the same time, some upflow pushing. Uh, they tell me that the uh, Willapaw Hills are being pushed up a little bit, uh, a few millimeters a year or something like that. And so, uh, so it's interesting, the, the alternating layers of pillow basalt marine twisted and were warped by collusion and formed the Willapaw Hills. And uh, so here's what this basalt looks like at the, at the location of the dam. This is a new bridge. It used to be over the tin bridge carrying the PL water line. But this is weathered basalt, and you can see just immediately it's cracked, and and uh, uh, you, we'll see some more pictures of it here. And here's a side picture of it on the west side of the dam. And uh, uh, let's look at this for a minute. What we find is that uh, Warehouser has uh, uh, rock pits up there, and they and they take this rock and they they break it up to gravel and uh, as they say it's it's got it's got gas bubbles in it and so uh, they put it on warehouser people put it on the roads and I happen to know one of the guys who runs a boat, uh, road breaker up there and they they cuss at this rock because uh, the logging trucks just break up this gravel uh, within weeks and they got to keep putting another rock, another rock on it, and another layer. Well, it's free rock for them, uh, but it's it's terrible gravel, and uh, because it, it it breaks up under pressure. In fact, it's so weak the Department of Transportation refuses to use this kind of rock on the highways. Uh, they have a standard; uh, they call it an absorption standard, three percent absorption. Uh, because it's got gas bubbles and it'll absorb, actually absorbs water. And uh, uh, then, and uh, they found, the Department of Transportation found that if they use rock from the Wilpaw Hills on highways, uh, the highways start sinking. The, the weight of the trucks beating on the roads, and, and it is beyond my imagination, I didn't, you know, beyond my imagination, but they, yeah, they actually beat up the, the bed, road beds. And so the Department of Transportation refuses to get this rock because the absorption here and the willpop from this rock you're looking at is in the neighborhood of uh, six to nine uh, percent water, sometimes even higher. And so the point is that the Department of Transportation won't use this for rock on a road. And you think about uh, using any rock from the Willapaw Hills <clears throat> to build a dam, well, you're going to put it in a cement mixer. If you made cement at home, you know the rock gives you uh, the strength of cement. 
but if you put this kind of rock in a cement mixer, it's going to get, it's going to crumble and you're not going to have very big pieces of rock in there in your cement. You're going to have basic, it's going to turn into sand. If you've ever done any work with cement and, uh, without rock in it, where you do patchwork and stuff, that kind of, without rock, it tends to crack pretty easy. So, um, the, uh, whole stability of rock, uh, pillow basalt is, is, uh, is really poor. Okay. Um, uh, so let's look at some of the boreholes and they've got these little machines and this is a small drill rig and they take uh, the drilling uh, drill holes three inches in diameter or so and then you take a get core samples out and uh, in the woods up there and uh, here's what a core sample looks like uh, typically a core sample will be of good rock like the uh, hard rock from eastern washington there won't be any cracks at all in it and it'll have a chunk like this that'll be that'll be absolutely solid these pieces will not have any breaks but the material they took uh from uh, the will paul hills area where they're going to be building the dam has got a whole bunch of cracks and the phase one report in 2015 and the phase two report in 2017 uh have the words severe fracturing of the pillow basalt and you see this, you see this severe fracturing uh, that occur here in these samples. They just fall apart when you uh, take them out of the ground and you got, you're dealing with pieces. And so uh, you can see uh, different pictures here and you can see this picture is just, just the, the, the rock just fall, is really weak and falls apart. And again, here's the uh, cores and they take these uh, cores and store them in boxes like that. So they're all retrievable and, and you can go in and and uh, look at them. And, and I've got these documents because I've asked for them. And I've got thick documents that you can open up and look at the, the core logs and, and you can actually study this. And that's where these pictures came from. These are actual samples up there. So, okay, uh, let's go and look at cores going down to, uh, 240 some feet across the base of the dam. Now these are borehole numbers. And I'm going to show you. Uh, this is in the middle of the dam. So the, uh, this is on the the west side, and this is on the east side. And so what do you see? Well, the first thing you see is layers. And we talked about uh, Willapaw Hills being islands from the uh, Pacific Ocean. And this is indeed what you see. Here's a layer of basalt. Here's a layer of uh, marine sediment and basalt and then more marine sediment. So it's back and forth. And in some areas, it's, it's uh, and here's what's weird is that you get, uh, well, there's like a nine foot fracture layer of, of marine and then 14 basalt and, and then 15. So continuity is an issue uh, because these, uh, as you see, twisting and turning during the, the, the geological history, these uh, layers of basalt have been busted up. And same thing with the marine sediment, busted up. And so the third thing you look at is the, that this is fractured. Uh, there's over like here in this 47 feet of basalt, they'll, you can count the logs have these, they measure these fractures that occur in there. And it's, uh, it's not very dependable. It's not the solid rock that you see in from Eastern Washington. It's really solid and great for dams. This stuff isn't, is really, uh, terrible. And you can't, you can't get, uh, uh well, you can't get any rock bolt to stay in it. The, 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 the rock fractures when you drill a hole. Okay. So here's one of the questions <clears throat> and every geologist, well, I've, I've shown these pictures. We've talked to different geologists on this. And, and the question is this, you're, you're wanting to build a dam. And here's the centerpiece, by the way, BH2 is right in the center of the dam, it turns out. You've got 51 feet of basalt. Well, okay, there's a number of things that are about this basalt. First of all, in a dam, they like to take off about, because you've got overburden and stuff, and it's weathered on the top. So they generally rule of thumb is take about 10 feet off the top layer of basalt. Well, I get you down to about 40 feet. Well, the question is, a dam weighs a lot. A lot. 
I don't have the actual tons, but they have a calculation of the tons, and I could dig it out if I had, should, should have dug it out. But the, the, nobody has ever asked, answered the question, can 40 feet of basalt that's cracked and fractured support the weight of this dam? Because your marine sediment underneath is going to get squished, and it's soft. And it's, it's like a tennis shoe with these alternate layers of marine sediment. They're soft and they're not going to support uh, the weight. And so there's a whole series of questions. This relates back to some dams that have failed in the United States. There's been some, some big ones, uh, big failures. The St. Francis Dam in California is one of them where the, the dam actually sank. Uh, they didn't have a strong enough base. And so the dam started sinking and the uh, water started going underneath the dam and washing out the dam. If you want to go in and, and interested in dam failures, there's, there's hundreds of dam failures in the United States. Just go online and, and look up dam failures and, uh, that was, yeah, and, and you'll, you'll find uh, plenty of evidence of, and if you study and go study these different failure mechanisms, some are over top. There's a variety of failures, but some are included where they just sink. They don't have a solid enough base. This this over here on the, the east side doesn't look too bad. If the fact that the basalt wasn't so cracked, uh, you got a little marine layer up here at 12, and those are pretty soft, and, and typically a lot of water come through. Okay, let's look at some more uh, pictures. This is on the east end of the dam, the east hill. And this is where you're, you're, the, you're the engineer now. You're the design engineer. You've got to pick one of these spots. Uh, here's 200 feet. This borehole is 200 feet from DB5, 250 feet here, 400 feet. So you've got four locations and uh, to put your, the end of the dam against, the east end of the dam, which means you've got to put rock bolts in and uh, pour concrete around them, uh, have your concrete for, against these rock bolts on the, and hopefully the sides will, will hold. Well, over here, uh, not you've got a bunch of junk up here, miscellaneous stuff you got to dig out. Uh, you can't, this marine sediment won't hold rock bolts, it'll come loose. Uh, break up when, even when you're drilling the hole for the rock bolts. Uh, the basalt here, notice the 152 fractures and 100 feet of basalt. So this is pretty poor basalt. Uh, <laughs> again, you're looking at the, the east side. There's not, there's some continuity here maybe, but uh, uh, what's troublesome is this 112 feet of marine sediment here uh one of the uh documents uh i think it's, well actually both phase one and phase two documents have made this observation that this marine sediments here and that rather because they all plan on taking the overburden out if you're going to build a dam you got to take the overburden it's it's just dirt and soil gravel and sand and mixture of stuff you got to take that part off but when you come to this you excavate so that's excavating 32 plus another 10 40 plus 10, 30. So uh, their, their calculations of how much material you got to remove before you can start building the dam is a neighborhood of 30, 40 feet. Well, wait a minute. They say, wait, well, we got a little problem on the east side here where we got this, this soft uh, marine sediment, 112 feet. <laughs> what are we going to do with it? Are we going to drill? And that's the question. There's still, do we have to drill, I mean, excavate to 144 feet? Well, it's going to cost them a lot more money, and they don't have that in the cost estimate now, but that's still a puzzle. And then uh, 400 feet, a different place again, you've got the same situation where your basalt's only 45. If you're going to be trying to put rock bolts here, it isn't going to work. And this is this mixture here is just uh, not going to hold anything either. So you've got, you've got issues here on how to attach the dam to the side. And these are important issues because... If you're familiar with the Teton Dam in Idaho, 1947, it it failed before it got 50% full. They didn't even get the dam operation. They were just filling the reservoir. And why? Because the sides of the dam were were built into marine sediment. Uh, and there's four or five different terms: uh, claystone, sandstone, uh, 
it's sand that's under pressure, uh, being a, a mile under the ground, under the ocean, and various depths under the ocean. Is, but it's still breakable. You can break it with a hammer, uh, or your hands sometimes you to break it. In fact, I've got an outcrop on on my uh, LLC uh, and PL. I can actually show you the outcrop with the rivers digging into one of these uh, layers of basalt and uh, just breaking it up. And you take the pieces of rock and just break it with your fingers. And uh, so it's really it, you can't put a dam against this and expect the dam to. Uh, uh, and if you want to get more information on the Teton Dam, just T E T O N dam failure and uh, on the internet and that'll give you all the background information but this is a struggle in terms of trying to find a spot there in uh, south of PL in the Wilpaw Hills of, uh, of, of adequate uh, geology where you've got now look at this this is this is a lot more basalt in here this is a tunnel uh, closer to the river and they want to drill a tunnel uh, to put water during construction so they can divert the river through this. Uh, a couple interesting things here uh, that I want to point out. Uh, first of all is this one area over here uh, on the uh, that one end of the tunnel, 380 feet from this uh, borehole. There's no there's no basalt. <laughs> uh, they go down, I mean, down to 100 feet, there's no basalt. And they want to put a tunnel uh probably in the neighborhood because you can see they only went to 100 feet here so they're probably think wanting to put a tunnel in about 60 50 60 feet deep and uh while you're going to do that it's probably going to be through here basalt but it's again it's weak and what the water is going to do to that i don't know but time here it gets to this it'll wash this out uh the sand and gravel and, and the, the marine sediment is too soft so uh, in terms of trying to build a tunnel, you're going to have a problem here. In terms of continuity, there's another interesting thing. Borehole uh, TB3 is only 20 feet from uh, TB4. These two boreholes are 20 feet apart, folks. And we talk about continuity. Well, here's a basalt layer that's 110 feet uh, of basalt. Next to it, 20 feet away, the basalt's only 34 feet. This drives the geology nuts, a geologist nuts, uh, because he, you expect to, you're going to have 100 and, oh, I'm sorry, 110 feet of basalt all the way through here. And you move 20 feet and you only got 34 feet of basalt. Come on. This is, uh, as I say, it drives the geologist nuts uh, because here you got marine, uh, you know, fractures here. And then you move over 200 feet. And now the marine layer is only 12 feet, and the basalt's uh, better. And and uh, so you you get this kind of observations. And as they say, it's it's a <laughs> they they say it's a challenge to geologists. But it it uh, and there's a phrase in a perfect world, geology would want rock just like I showed you before from Eastern Washington. That's the kind of rock they want to work. It's solid. But in reality, uh, all your geology books say this is what you actually find. You don't find that perfect rock out there as a rule. Uh, nine times out of ten, this is the kind of jump you're going to find with uh, alternating layers, lack of continuity, and just a puzzle. And it's a real challenge. Okay. <clears throat> Besides the geology, there's some uh, looming issues, I call them. Uh, <clears throat> that haven't been discussed much. Most people aren't aware of them. We're going to quickly uh, look at those and uh, see. Uh, I got to see time-wise here. We're getting on, so we got to move. Start moving pretty quick. Uh, the first is that the PL water treatment plant uh, gets water from a road uh, up here, up Lester Creek. So this is the PL water line, and this is going to be underneath the dam, and uh, so they're. They can't have that. Uh, the the water line can't be under. They're going to have to move the water line, and they probably have to move the reservoir, and over from Lester Creek, move it over west to Rock Creek or east to Stowe Creek. And the cost of moving that uh, water line is not in in the, in the dam estimate, uh, and it's going to be in the millions, uh, 10 million, 20 million to put a new water source for the city of PL. A second point that most people aren't aware of is that this reservoir is going to 
uh, cover uh, the main uh, main line road. Road 1000 is the main line, which 50, 60 logging trucks a day uh, come up and down this road to uh, to the to miles of warehouse or property. And uh, under the proposed operation of a flow through dam, this would only be underwater for up to 20, 30 days maximum. But the road would be in terrible con condition and you'd have to rebuild the road. And it's going to cost millions of dollars to do this over a period of time. And what the, the right thing to do. And so what what, what the Lewis County Flood District says, well, Warehouser, you can just use your back roads. Well, these are emergency roads. I've used those uh, back roads. <laughs> you don't want to be driving on these back roads. Some of them are, are mud, uh, mud holes, stuff. They're totally impossible uh, for 50 truck loads of log, logging trucks to come down one way, little roads on mountaintops, and uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, you're going to have to build a new road around this proposed reservoir, Road 1000 up here. Building a new Road 1000 is going to be million, you got six miles or so of of a uh, new road you're going to have to put with gullies, uh, bridges uh, for creeks, uh, trestles. Uh, it's going to be anywhere from 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe as much as 50 million bucks that, uh, to put bypass roads around the reservoir for Weyerhaeuser, although to, to maintain Weyerhaeuser operations. Both the replacement of the water line and the rebuilding of this road are going to have to occur two to three years before you even start construction of the, of the dam. Two or three other, uh, a couple other uh, surprising uh, aspects of the uh, of the uh, the dam itself here is that uh, they're proposing to take uh, to build a dam. You need 800,000 gallons of water per day, and uh, right now the uh, Department of Ecology shuts down the. the uh, the water users, uh, uh, junior water rights from May to October for the last 10 years they've, or so, they've uh, shut them down because the water flow at uh, at the Doty gauge is uh, uh, insufficient to support fish. Uh, and and there's basically, as you know, in the summertime, the Shalis River between Shalis and Centralia is basically just a lake. It doesn't move. You can't see any movement in there. And why is that? Because, uh, well, you do have movement up here. Uh, but the Pival senior water rights are pumping water out of the river, and uh, for but the, the senior guys are protected, and the junior rights cut off. So, uh, what's not in any cost estimate is the fact for six months of the year, uh, dam construction is going to have to bring water 800,000, almost a million gallons a day to for dam construction. It's going to be hauled in. Well, that cost is. Uh, we estimated somewhere between 20 and 30 million bucks that's not in the cost estimate. And, uh, and then there's another issue of rock. We talked about they're trying to uh, do some uh, rock testing up here, and they found that, uh, again, the rock absorption is, is way high. Department of Transportation can't, won't let them use the rock for highway production or uh, construction. But uh, <laughs> same thing here. That, if you're going to get, want good rock, you're going to have to, uh, for the dam, you're going to have to go about 20 miles north of PL up under the, uh, some of the good basalt that's in uh, towards Elma in the hills up that way and create new uh, rock quarries up there and haul the rock. And again, you're starting talking 10, 20, 30 million dollars for hauling rock 20 miles and they don't want to do that. And so you've got these. Uh, they're playing a little trick here in terms of contingency. Normally, when you have a big project like this, you have a uh, what's called a contingency fund, 25, 35 percent, somewhere in there, that range. And and uh, contingency is supposed to be for things that you don't expect to happen. Uh, totally, but these are things you know are going to happen in what the Lewis County Flood Control District has said. Well, uh, this uh, new water line that's contingent. We uh, and that's not a uh, new road for warehouser. That's that's just put it in contingency. Uh, hauling water during the summertime, uh, that's contingency. Hauling rock for 20 miles away, well, that's good. You can't, if you know that it's what it is, you, your cost estimate is supposed to show it. You cannot put items and just bury them uh, into contingency when you know they're not, uh, know they're going to happen. And and uh, and you've got to uh, put a cost estimate 
a, a placeholder in your in your uh, cost estimate for the dam, and that's one of the reasons the uh, the cost of the dam has been uh, skewed lower. Uh, you actually put all these additional things they're calling contingencies, which aren't. Uh, their planned uh, activities are going to have to be done. Uh, they're not showing them as that, and so it's going to increase the. Uh, another myself and another engineer did. We did independent calculations on this, and we the the cost way exceeds uh, uh, the benefits of this dam. So it would probably will never be built. But okay, let's move on. All oh, water channels under the dam. Yeah, all this. Uh, uh, soft rock and marine sediments are, have a lot of openings and stuff. And so there's a lot of water under the movement under the dam. And you've got a, the, the guys doing the design. Uh, I've been in meetings with them and they say, oh, no problem. We'll just grout it. Well, the, the thing with grouting is uh, injecting grout. What is grout? Well, it's just cement without the rocks. It's just cement and sand. And you push this down in there and it's you get quick drying cement. Or, uh, yeah, and it's supposed to plug holes. Well. Howard Hansen Dam uh, had leaks around it, and uh, they they dropped the reservoir to 50 percent uh, because it was they were concerned about the dam failing. And so uh, a friend of mine is a Corps of Engineers and he works there, and he told me they spent over 100 million uh, injecting grout because it's a, it's a guess when you when you just drill a hole and you go down well what 30 feet, you drill a hole 30 feet and you put pressure. And this grout's supposed to expand into holes, so it fills the holes, but you don't know how far. Is it going to go six inches? Is it going to go 12 inches? Is it going to go a foot or two, three feet? You have no idea. And so it's, it's totally uh, serendipity, um, serendipitous, I suppose. And uh, the engineer at uh, Howard Hansen Dam told me, he said, well, we slowed the leaks down. Uh, so we can go up above 50% of the dam now, but we've got another 100, maybe 200 million dollars to more grouting because, and we did some experiments over at Hanford on grouting, trying to uh, grout containment around the uh, radioactive waste in the grounds, and, and we gave up on it because there's no quality control. You can't tell if you're getting a solid. And same thing, uh, there's uh, the engineers, the dam engineers, uh, have an argument going on in the National Association across the country. Do you put one grout? They call it what it's called, grout curtain, which means you put uh, to uh, head of the dam, upstream from the dam, you start injecting concrete into the ground. And uh, uh, but do you do it every three feet, every two feet? They argue back and forth, and how many? They, and, they say, and then some people say two. There's one professor down in California who argues for three grout curtains. And none of this is, is, is highly expensive. None of it's been put in the damp calculations. You're going to be 100, 100 million, 200 million uh, putting in grout curtains. Is, and they're still arguing. Oh, that's going to be an argument right uh, on. It's never. Uh, highly fractured zones were the, let's, I, I, these are words right out of phase two, page 32, the phase two site characteristic report. And let's just read the highly fractured zones where large openings, fractured crude bedrock were identified. Unless treated, these fractures could act as professional uh, or preferential seepage passages uh, beneath the dam foundation and abutment. This may result in excessive water pressures acting on the base of the dam or other structures element, resulting in unwanted loss of stored water. Grouting to reduce flow through fractures in the rock will be an important component of the dam design. A number of zones of uncertainty exist and need to be explored in future designs. And what they've been doing uh, on these reports is kicking the can down the road right here. It says a number of zones uncertainty existed. So because uncertainty, the uncertainty certainly exists and needs to be explored in future designs. And, and that's how it keeps going on and on. OK, let's look at uh, maximum uh, water uh reductions that have expected from the dam and it's interesting because the first one here shows the water reduction at the dodi gauge and uh, they say water reduction uh is within the normal river channel and they say it you can get up to was it uh, let me get this bigger here okay you can uh 100 year flood you can get 11 feet drop of water and 17 with the major flood. 
but let's look at the Levin. And so they're saying that the dam will reduce floodwaters uh, by 11 feet uh, at Doty. Well, first of all, uh, there is no floodplain at Do uh, where the, in the Doty area because the, uh, and we'll see that in a minute, uh, because the, the river's in a channel. So what they're doing is they're mislabeling this. This isn't floodwater. It's being reduced. This is water inside the channel of a river. Now, flood water is water that leaves the channel. But since there is a nice deep channel at the uh, the, uh, the Doty gauge, uh, the uh, water that drops down, the, the dam will lower water there. Eleven. Uh, oh, by the way, this is a, a mathematical model they're using to predict this. Uh, the model is still under development and. Uh, have some variations to it. We'll get to in a minute. Okay, so you get down downstream of the South Fork, you're talking uh, about five feet of water. By the time you get to Adna, you're getting close to two feet reduction. And uh, by the time they get to Chehalis area, you're down to a foot and a half. And these are maximum reductions a dam will give you. And uh, what? Uh, and this is high up here. This is mostly. Uh, reduction of water level here is uh, due to the levee and stuff like that. But you can see all the way down to uh, Montesano and Aberdeen, Cosmopolis, uh, the, the effect of the dam is under two feet of reduction. Now, that in the Shales area is one and a half feet, Centralia 1.7, I guess that is. And the, those are maximum layers. And if you read the statistical uh, document, uh, the, the statistics say that uh, this 1.5 will only occur about 20% of the time. 50% of the time, it's going to be less than a foot in the Shalis, uh, in the Shalis area. So the question is, okay, why well, are you going to spend uh, up to a billion, do billion dollars for a dam? It's only going to lower the water one foot, uh, particularly since the water level in, in a 100-year flood in some of those cases uh, we'll tell it to the dairy bar on Main Street where the hamburgers stand, where they had four feet of water. Yeah, uh, you're telling them, oh, this dam will lo lower your flood water in your uh, your hamburger stand from four feet to three feet. Well, that's going to really make them happy. And uh, there are people in Centralia, Shales area, that had their house flooded with eight feet of water. Tell them, uh, yeah, instead of uh, eight feet, you're only going to have six feet of water in your house. That's that's going to really make people happy. Uh, Let's talk about the Doty gauge a little bit because the Doty gauge is located behind the, that cheese factory here. Their cheese is really good. The goat cheese is the, the, from that farm. You can buy that uh, here at the Doty. And so it it's in a channel here, and it doesn't. And same thing with Doty. Doty is never flooded. I went and talked to the people that live in this area here, and they've never had water except maybe the people right on the river and then over here on the Elk Creek Road. Uh, these people here have had floods, but. Uh, the channel uh so they talk about the, the eis actually says the uh, dam will lower uh flood levels uh, 10 feet in doty absolutely wrong uh there's the flood water level uh the drops in this area is more like five three to five feet okay well anyhow um then you got 100 in your floodplain here you notice no there's no floodplain in the doty area because the water stays with inside of a nice deep channel you have a little flooding here uh, the major flooding area, of course, is in the Ceres area and the Shalis area, like that. Uh, the benefit, the, so you, uh, this, the, the change of the flood le uh, levels down here uh, isn't very much. The benefits are very low for the Shalis and Centralia. The effect, basically, the dam has very, uh, a, a pretty small. Again, here we again uh, are the differences in flood elevation. This Levin is uh, is a wrong number totally wrong number it's mislabeled as a flood reduction proper label it's reduction of water within the normal river channel and that's a reduction all right but it's inside the river channel it's not a flood uh, there so anyhow again it just supports the fact that you've seen it before that uh, once you get to uh, uh, the Adna area and stuff like that you're down to area in the Centralia area you, yeah, you have very uh, minimal amount of uh, flood reduction Let's talk about uh, when I was at Hanford, 
uh, we were concerned about, uh, I was a manager of safety, assistant manager of safety programming uh, for the basalt waste isolation project. We're going to drill down into basalt uh, 3,000 feet deep. We were concerned about, well, were the uh, uh, glaciers uh, going to be an issue? And some guy in Germany put up a back in, it was in the 80s, back in the 1980s, we were looking at it. Found, we found a German uh, scientist who said there were three glacier periods and we were, we were near the top. And then uh, since then, they've come up and figured there's been eight glacier periods. And they're about on a general area of uh, 100,000 year cycles. And we're just getting near the top of one. So we are, and we know that because the glaciers are melting. So. We're in a cycle and, you know, the big issue today is climate change and, and what the effect of man. And I'm, I'm not getting into that. Other people are smart enough and we'll talk about that later. Uh, another interesting uh, article is a, one guy has estimated uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 800,000 years. And he's found eight cycles as well. And so it's related to the glaciers. And I won't get into that. <coughs> I want to start closing up. By talking about uh, the warming and uh, there's some estimates of warming and these are estimates and and again uh, they're still pondering that and, and uh, you can see different people have different estimates of five degrees ten degrees warming over the next uh, 100 years or, or so so uh, we'll see this is uh, one, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. This is from the uh, University of Washington Climate Impacts Group. <clears throat> Just a second, excuse me. <clears throat> this is interesting because sea level rise, uh, <clears throat> seven inches in the last hundred years. Okay, uh, I don't know how you tell that. And they're estimating. 24 inches in the next 100 years. <coughs> okay, well, that's, and what the problem would be, the backwater effect, slower drainage in Aberdeen and Hoquin. Then you get snowpack reduction. The basin is basically rain dominated, but 23 of the basin has notable snowpack, which is mostly from the Olympics. And they're saying in by 2050, the snowpack will decline by 80%, creating a higher runoff. Again, they talk about increase in atmospheric rivers, and you, you've already sensed that, whether it's 77 days a year or 10 or whatever, it doesn't make much difference. <coughs> Here's the key point. At Porter right now, 127 tons per year of sediment is building up from Grace Harbor. There's increase in winter erosion, plus a higher seas has a higher backwater effect, less ability for sediment to exit the system, plugging channel. So <laughs> this picture is worth a thousand words. I don't have time for a thousand words. January 7th was the last time that Highway I-5 was closed for a few hours. And it was basically closed because the water from the Wacom came in and started flooding the uh, uh, access ramp on South Chehalis. And they predicted a higher, uh, flow, a higher flooding than actually occurred. But what happened? I did an analysis of the water flying off of the Olympics. And you see that there's a lot more water hitting the Chehalis River during a rainstorm in this area than coming out of the Chehalis River Basin uh, in the Centralia Chehalis area. And fundamentally, the first one, the water comes out as a scoop and truck, but it hits the Black River and doesn't have anywhere to go. Black River's backed up by all the Sats River and all these other rivers coming off of here. Part of the problem is <coughs> there's nowhere for all this flood water that develops water in our area to go. 
scoop em truck backs up. You walk them, hits the scoop em truck and backs up. By the time the south fork comes in, the shale is it's already flooded from the walk -em. The water up the, uh, be held by the dam would also be backed up. And we're talking about more higher seas and more sediment. We're going to be having to uh, clear out the sediment uh, of Grace Harbor. It's going to be filling with, with I, I, I couldn't believe, 120, uh, over 125,000 tons of sediment per year. I want to show you this at the Shalis River at Montesino. And this was, um, yeah, this is the flood in the, uh, January 7th or 6th, 2022. And you start off by saying, uh, you just sit there and here's the title. So uh, high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. What happens here? Here's low tide. What, what's this from? This is the water coming out of the Olympics, the Southern Olympic Mountains, raises from low tide to high tide, 12 feet difference. It's a barrier. Okay, go back to high tide, 11 feet to 16 feet. You've got a five foot barrier during this rainstorm. All of a sudden, the Chehalis River at Alma, Grand Mound, Chehalis and Centralia is looking at a five foot barrier, like building a five foot uh, dam across Chehalis River in, in Aberdeen or Montesano. There's nowhere for it to go. It backs up. Then this, this is so illustrative of, uh, illustrative of the situation here. But in other words, building a dam down here and holding some of the water back is going to help. But there's some bigger issues and they're even going to get worse as the snowpack comes down, more water, higher sea levels. Uh, we've got some challenges, folks, and I'm not sure uh, dam has been. Uh, uh, so actions, we got to stop building in the floodplains. we got to buy out residents in the floodplain, convert it to agriculture and rhetoric. It's going to get worse. I'm in favor of building levees. Uh, and I could talk about other ones, but let's just assume I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm particularly interested, right? The first levee I would build is right here between Chambers Way and, and Hill, uh, West Street. Uh, these businesses are, are being flooded with four or five feet of water. You can see some of the mobile homes floating there on I-5, just Chambers Way here in Chehalis. And you can see how close to the top of it. it's flooded and how close that, that sign is flooded. And... There's no reason for this to flood. Uh, a dam would lower the water in here a foot or two. Uh, a levee will keep this dry. So, I'd, man, I'd be the first thing I would do is work like Aberdeen and Hokum did. And they got a, a, a barrier to, to protect houses and businesses and stuff like that from flooding. And that'd be my first spot right there. It's close. Galvin area is predicted. Uh, this is expansion by 2018. The, the gray and the red show well uh, the red uh, so this, this is mid-range and then the high end is flooding uh in this area so again galvin needs and the shales river is running up through here uh galvin needs uh, uh a levee in here to keep this dry uh and again that's what that's one of the areas you'd look at here's uh centralia here's the galvin area again where you would you could build a levee around here and, and help protect that. Uh, the Noachum, I mean, the Skookumchuk's already got a levee that protects up here somewhat. And uh, let's see, the ones I'm interested in, the fairgrounds down here. The fairgrounds, uh, they predict uh, for uh, another 50 years, the flood level will reach 12 feet. If you build a dam, that'll reduce that flooding of the fairgrounds from 12 feet to 10 feet. So if anybody wants to tell you, talk, say, tell you the dam is is uh, really really great, ask them about how great it is to reduce the flooding at the fairground from 12 feet to 10 feet, because that's all the dam is going to do. And my answer is, hey, Salter Creek is coming through here. Build an iron levee around Salter, along Salter Creek in this area. 
protect not only the fairground, but a fair view area here to keep these businesses dry. A levee keeps businesses dry all across the country. Levees have kept it. Well, people have asked me, well, what about uh, the cost? And well, uh, at some point, you got to say uh, the cost uh, is uh, is uh, is something that you've got to you want to keep people dry. Uh, why build something? Uh, why spend a billion dollars only to reduce uh, flooding by one foot or two feet and still be left with flooding of two, three, four, five feet? Uh, you really want to do something to keep the things dry. Last puzzle, <clears throat> and uh, this is an interesting puzzle because the Noachum is different. Something's going on in the Noachum. The 2007 flood wasn't the highest. 1996 was the highest number here, which tells you that the flood level, uh, the storm level came in from 96, uh, came in uh, over this area. Uh, the 2009 flood is one of the highest floods in the Noachum, which says the storm came up by five. Um, and it's, the, the, the data is, is there's a lot more, uh, data point. If you try to establish the baseline, there's a lot more points above that than at uh, Grand Mound or Doty. Something's going on in the Noachum Valley. And I don't know what, and most people don't haven't figured this out yet, but something's going on there that we're getting more flooding and you're going to be predicting more flooding in the Noachum Valley. And that's uh, solving that is going to be a, is a real challenge. But it's a puzzle. Uh, it's different than the rest. I took the Noachum, and, and I remember we had, a, we had high water, I call it, December 6. But the interesting point about this high water is you notice the peak that we had uh, back December 6 on the Noachum uh, flood near Chehalis that reached 204 feet. The all-time high on the uh, was uh, 2,896 of 2,005 and a half feet. Guys, we had flooding. Not a, that wasn't a major flood December 6th, yet the Milwaukee River was one and a half feet from its all-time record. Something's going on with Milwaukee. The There's a lot more water coming down the Milwaukee now, and it seems to be increasing. And why, I don't know, but that's... The focus really needs to be uh, the Skookumchuk, kind of the same way. They didn't have data prior. Well, 2007, not much uh, water came out of the Skookumchuk at the point they took measurements at there. But January 2009, there was a peak, and January 7th was near an all-time peak. So why is the Skookumchuk hitting its all-time peak in 2009 and 2022? Something's, uh, and it's a short-term kind of thing. It's only over the last uh, 13, 14 years. But uh, Skookumchuk and then Noachum are two rivers that are uh, of interest. Last point, and I'll, I'll close the conversation, is they're going to move the uh, dam upstream. Uh, and this is right on the border, these two. Uh, this is a downstream number, so a dam, so I'm not, or borehole, so I'm not going to talk much about that. <laughs> but what's interesting is the West Bank, uh, they moved it uh, over 500,000 feet upstream, and it went, they had a good, strong area. This, the, the, the hard rock, they get called Gabbro, is only 33 feet, and then you get a marine sediment of 200 feet, and they say it's highly fractured uh, with moderate water passages. You can't, this would be the west end of the dam. You can't build uh, into marine sediment. Just won't hold it. Now you get down here, you got some stuff, but uh, the hard rock that you, and it says frequent mechanical breaks, uh, that it breaks easily with mechanical action. Well, uh, earthquakes are mechanical action too. <laughs> and uh, the the basalt and, and the marine sediments in the Willowfall Hills have really uh, had a lot of fracturing and cracking and busting in misdirections and stuff as, as the earth has changed. And so it's a, it's really a geological mess up there. But just moving this, the, 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 uh, the dam upstream, or to, they're going to drill 10 more or 15, I guess it's 15 more boreholes on, on my property here this next year and this coming year. And uh, 
they're going to find the same thing. It's they're, you're not going to be able to find solid basalt. You're going to find this mixture of stuff. And how do you how do you build a solid dam on that? And so I still am a promoter of saying, uh, guys, I don't even think you can build a dam on, on geology. I've I've talked to four different geologists and they all agree with me. And they say you cannot build a dam on this stuff. It won't support a dam. And uh, I'm trying to get the Department of Ecology to bring in some outside consultants and they, they'll uh, safety guys from across the country and they'll, they'll look at this and say the same thing. And then in addition of the levees, if you build a levee, it'll keep the keep everything dry. And I uh, so anyhow, that's the, that's my talk. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. it. Gives you an insight and uh, and we'll see what happens. There's a lot of things to be solved and it's, uh, we've got a lot of challenges ahead. We've just only got a, a small start right now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.